goal of this video is just to give you some idea of what machine code looks like. We aren't going to study the details of any particular language, or compiler, or optimization techniques. Instead, we're going to look at the general structure of code generated by the C and Java compilers to look for patterns in what the machine code for various constructs will look like. In order to understand the code we're about to see, it's important that you understand that there are two places where information can be stored. Most information is stored in main memory. That's where the stack and the heap and the code are stored. When the CPU needs to use that information, it has to execute a load instruction to bring the data into the CPU. Similarly, when the CPU wants to change a value in memory, it has to use a store instruction. Now, different languages use different words for load and store, but every language needs to do that. The data that is in the CPU is stored in data locations called registers. There are a small number of these in the CPU. Some of the registers have specific purposes, like the ones that hold the program counter and the stack pointer. Other registers are used to hold the data that the CPU is currently working on. To start, let's look at some straight line code to see how things are oriented. This is the Java bytecode that the compiler generates. Each line is labeled with L and the line number. At the bottom, it has a description of the local variables. For each one, including this, it lists the scope of that variable within this method and then gives each one a number. So x is visible from lines L1 to L5 and is variable number 1, while y is visible from lines L2 to L5 and is variable number 2. Notice that Java bytecode isn't paying any attention to where things are stored. This code is going to be interpreted by the Java virtual machine. That's the part of the system that knows about the details of the physical machine, so the Java virtual machine will, will know where x and y are really stored. Now, Java bytecode is very nice because it tells you which code is for which source statement. So, here you can see it makes a 42 and it stores it into x, which is variable number 1. Then the next statement loads what is in x and stores it into y. So, straight line code translation into Java bytecode is pretty straightforward. The code the C compiler generates is a little trickier. A little? Really? Just a little? Okay, I admit it. It looks pretty nasty. Let me walk you through it. In this code, the variables are stored on the stack. That means that the addresses where x and y are stored will be relative to the base pointer. The base pointer is the register that points at the bottom of the current stack frame. So x is 4 bytes above the base pointer, and y is 8 bytes above the base pointer. Each int takes 4 bytes. That's why x and y are 4 bytes apart. The move instruction and its variants are used to move information from the CPU to memory, or vice versa. Essentially, move is either load or store. So this instruction is storing 42, which is 2a in hex, into x's location on the stack. The next instruction in our C code is storing the value that's in x into y. To do that, the CPU has to load the value in x into one of the registers, and then store the content of that register into y. The third statement requires loading y into a register, and then multiplying 14 times the value in that register and storing the result back into that same register, and then storing from that register into x. While the code generated by C seems more complicated, there's still a direct mapping from our instructions to the instructions generated by the compiler. Now let's look at the code for a simple conditional. In Java, we can see that these two statements are the print statements. Notice that system.out is a static variable in the print stream class. We load a constant that is the string we want to print and we make a remote call into the print line method. That means that this part must be the if statement. It loads the first local variable, x, and the if le means if less than or equal to jump to l1. So, basically, it uses a conditional jump to skip the stuff in the then block if it should. Okay, that doesn't seem so bad. 
Now let's look at the same thing in C. In C, the two print statements get translated into something that starts with an LEA instruction. LEA stands for Load Effective Address. Right. So that instruction is loading the address of the constant that we want to print. And then the call queue is calling the printf function. That means that these first two statements are the if. It is loading x into a register. Yes, this time x is a local variable that is 10 bytes below the base pointer. It compares x to 0. Then JLE means jump less than or equal, which it uses to skip the then block, jumping to here only if appropriate. While the C machine code and the Java bytecode feel very different, there's actually a pattern to these. Evaluate the thing in the condition, then use a conditional jump to skip the then block if we should. Let's do the same thing for an if then else statement. Here, you can see it load x, and if it's less than or equal to zero, conditional jump to line L1. Then we see the code for the then block, which is immediately followed by a jump to skip the code in the else block. Then we have the code for the else block, which is where the conditional jump would take us. After that is the code beyond the if then else statement. So basically, if we're going to do the then block, the conditional jump, that if le, doesn't jump, and we do the unconditional jump, go to, at the end of the then block to skip the else block. On the other hand, if we're going to need to do the else block, the conditional jump is taken, and we just execute from there. We can see the same general structure for an if then else compiled in C. We evaluate the condition, and then there's a conditional jump to the else block. At the end of the then block, there's an unconditional jump to skip the else block. So we can generalize how if then else statements are translated into machine code. You can find evaluating the condition, the then block, and the else block. There's a conditional jump after evaluating the condition that takes us to the else block if we should go there. If we don't take that jump, we'll execute the then block and then jump past the else block. One more, let's look at while loops. In Java, the code follows the way we think of while loops. At the top of the loop, we evaluate a condition, and there's a conditional jump that we take if the loop is ending. Then we have the body of the loop, and at the end of that, there's an unconditional jump to go back to the top of the loop. Interestingly, the code generated by GCC from Sigwin has a different strategy for encoding while loops. To start, notice that this is the code for the printf after the loop, because we're printing out the value in y. These two statements are the ones that set up x and y, so they aren't part of the loop. That means that this code is the entire loop. I can see that this is the line that is inside the loop where we add 3 to y, because y is a local variable, so its address is relative to the base pointer. The code for the loop condition is actually at the bottom of the loop. Uh, that's weird. This isn't a do while loop. It has to check the condition before it executes the stuff inside the loop. I agree. That's why this jump statement is here. The first thing the loop does is jump past the stuff inside the loop to the code that checks the condition. If the loop needs to keep running, it jumps to the stuff inside the loop. That's clearly a different strategy than Java used or than the way I think about while loops working. So there are at least two strategies for how while loops can be translated into machine code. C uses a strategy where the condition is at the end of the loop code. At the start of the loop, we jump down to that condition, and it jumps back to the inner part of the loop if the loop should keep running. Java uses a strategy where the condition is at the top of the loop and has a conditional jump that gets us out of the loop. At the bottom of the loop, it always jumps to the top of the loop. While the Java one matches the way people think about while loops, the C one has one big advantage. Think about what jumps happen each pass through the loop. In the Java strategy, we have one unconditional jump and one conditional jump. In the C strategy, the unconditional jump is outside of the code that repeats. Because the condition is at the bottom, we only have the unconditional jump. I hope this video has given you some idea of what machine code looks like 
and how the compiler translates some typical coding constructs. Clearly, there's a lot more to what machine language really is and the magic of how the compiler translates the code, but a high-level understanding is a good start.